We are live from Oklahoma City State Department of Education. This is Michelle Sutherland. I'm here, I'm the Director of Prevention Services, and we are here to present um, a great training for you. We're presenting drugs and alcohol in schools, what is this trending, how to spot it, and the role of a counselor. Um, I would like everybody to take a minute right now and please sign in, even if you are um, watching with a friend, I need each person to sign in, please. I'm going to type it in the, the comments section too, so you'll have it um, later, so you can sign in that way too. Um, this is important for a couple of reasons. One, it lets me send you your CEUs, which is important. Um, two, it lets me send everybody a professional development sheet. Um, that you're a certificate so you can prove to your principals that yes, when my door was shut on Tuesday and I had that sign out that said don't bother me, I'm learning, um, then there actually was something really important happening. So if you would please sign into this. Um, and three, it will allow us to communicate with you in the future. Um, a, we, we have a, um, a that course evaluation that's really important for, to us that you fill out, like I said a minute ago. Um, we want all your feedback so we can make these better um, and keep these. Inf this information is something that you really want to, to have. So um, give you what, just a little bit more time to sign in on that tiny URL, um, drugs webinar, and we're going to get started here momentarily. So one thing I want you to know is that you're going to have the ability at any time to chat if you look in the right-hand corner of your screen, you're going to be able to chat and ask questions in real time. Um, we'll also ask questions at the end, obviously, but if you need a question answered immediately, if you don't understand something, um, I, it's really important that you chat. So I had somebody say they're not seeing me. Yes, they are. We have started. Unfortunately, I can't stop once we get started. So hopefully they will refresh. I'll go back one more time to this window right here. And just in case anybody can't get started. Okay, today we have with us a guest. We have Gina Pratt with us. She's the senior agent with the ABLE Commission. That's the Alcohol Beverage Laws Enforcement Commission. Um, she is kind of a rock star because she can walk in and tell us all the things that we need to know. I looked at her material and it's so good. I can't wait for you guys to hear it. You have me with you too. It's Michelle Sutherland here, Director of Prevention Services here at the State Department of Education. And last time we did a webinar, nobody could really tell what we look like. So I'm showing you, this is our pictures. So now you know what we look like when you're, we're talking today. And I'm gonna apologize, I have a cold. So if I sound a little nasally, that's probably why. And I also am seeing that my font didn't translate very well into this computer, so it might look a little bit funny, but it is where we're going. So I'd like to introduce you to Gina Pratt right now. She's going to come and do the first part of our session, um, and then she's going to talk to you about alcohol, then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about drugs, and then how a counselor can, what your role as a counselor with students who um, are, have drugs, have drug, drugs at school, or have a drug problem. So Gina? It's all you. You can take over, and we're so glad that you're with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I really appreciate it. I'm excited that you guys asked me, the Department of Education asked me to come and talk to you. This is really an awesome opportunity. As Michelle said, my name is Gina Pratt. I'm with the Alcohol Beverage Laws Enforcement Commission out of Oklahoma City. I'm a senior agent with them. I've been with them for about 22 years, and the last five years or so, I've been with the Too Much to Lose grant, which is Oklahoma's underage drinking initiative. And I teach classes like this to law enforcement, civic groups uh, um, across the Oklahoma. So it's a, uh, I do a lot of training with my job. So we're going to go ahead and dive into this. I've got a lot of information I'm going to get to you guys, and, and we'll, we'll just get going. Uh, alcohol costs and consequences, um, we're going to touch in that there are risks in, that are involved with it, and they do... Uh, involved with youth, the, it affects them academically and their athletics and obviously their overall health. And here's a really good, I'm really a visual person, here's a good visual. I'll talk to you about uh, brain development and it, how your brain develops in stages. The prefrontal cortex associated with impulse control consequences and context and judgment, those are, that's one of the last places to mature on an uh, individual, that's that prefrontal uh, cortex. 
and it really doesn't mature until you're about 24 years of age. So you have young people that um, are underage anyway, and they're making, uh, they don't have the, the best uh, ability to be making those good choices anyway because that frontal lobe is not fully developed. And you throw alcohol in the mix, and you're just putting bad decisions upon bad decisions. Here's another um, video, or not video, but uh, image for you to look at, but you can see how it goes from five years to 20 years. You can see the reasoning, memory, decision-making, skill perfection, and skill innovation, performance capacity, is that it, which uh, matures later on. And here's another visual for you to look at. It shows a normal brain and for a 15-year-old and an alcohol user for a 15-year-old. You can see some really uh, astounding uh, deficits because of the alcohol use. We're going to talk just a little bit. I'm going to get into some basics, but I think some of this basic information is really some good information for uh, those that are looking to gain more information about alcohol. You really need to know some of these basics. This is how alcohol goes through your body. You can see it goes through the, the mouth, stomach, the small intestines, the brain, and the liver. There's a couple of things I want you to take away from this. Um, if you ha don't have food into your stomach, uh, it takes about five minutes from it to reach from your stomach to your brain before you start seeing those changes in your brain. And also know that the liver is, uh, takes the brunt of the metabolizing. It's what um, exclusively metabolizes alcohol in your body. We're going to talk about blood alcohol concentration. That's some good basic information to have. You have determining factors when you're looking at that. The quality and type of alcohol that's consumed. You've got the amount of alcohol in the bloodstream. You've got gender. Women tend to have a slightly higher BAC than men after drinking the same amount. Weight plays a role, and also presence of food in the stomach can play a role, too. And it causes a variation of, a, of uh, alcohol. Amount of alcohol in the bloodstream, gender. Women tend to have a slightly higher BAC than men uh, after drinking the same quantity because they have less food in the body. Weight and speed of drinking. So one thing I like to point out, uh, you saw a picture of Michelle and I at the beginning. So we're pretty similar. But so if her and I were, BAC is good information to have. Uh, but let me put it, drive it home a little bit better for you. If her and I were to have the same drink, uh, it's not going to affect us the same way because everybody's different. She may have uh, not slept well last night. I may be on medication. You've got all kinds of things that go into it. So we like to tell people, especially those that serve alcohol, that your body can metabolize roughly a drink an hour. But that's very roughly because we're all so different. So we're looking here on this slide. It'll talk about points to ponder. The liver, liver metabolizes alcohol almost exclusively it's because the liver is one of the first parts of the body to suffer the harmful effects. That's why you hear about uh, persons that may be addicted to alcohol. You hear about cirrhosis of the liver and damage to the liver because it's doing that metabolizing. And here we talk about that blood alcohol concentration again. We have, you know, you can look at the charts for female and male and how it affects um, everybody differently. Know this, the 0.08 BAC is an illegal amount. And how can you tell what a person's BAC is? You really can't unless you do any kind of testing, a blood test breathalyzer. By looking at someone, you can't tell what BAC is. By looking at someone, you're getting that public intoxication, what you can see, hear, smell, articulate that way. And know this, too, that anybody under 21, there's zero. You can have zero amount of alcohol in their system for a legal amount. So how much can a person safely drink and drive? We like to say that really none. But as small as, small as a point as an amount of 0 0.02 can uh, affect your brain. So really it's just a minuscule amount that will start to make those changes in the brain. It's impossible to say that a certain number of grams of alcohol or a certain number of drinks will ensure safe driving, and it's impossible to predict the effects of alcohol. And really the only true safe level is not to drink and drive at all. I like to throw this one in here because it's just some good information to have because there's a lot of misconceptions um, across Oklahoma for this. You cannot ever be drunk in public in Oklahoma. So what is public? Public is anywhere the public can be, period. So really, the only place you can really be intoxicated is in the privacy of your own home, as long as nothing illegal happens at that point. So let's say you, uh, you have a neighbor that likes to, to do a lot of drinking, and he's drinking, he's, you know, you're getting to feeling pretty good, and about 2 in the morning he decides he's got the munchies and he wants to go to Taco Bell. What's happening? He's going out and getting in his car. It's no longer legal. He's leaving the, leaving the house. It's illegal at that point. So as long as nothing illegal happens, you can be at home and do that. Public is anywhere the public can be. Now, this next thing I'm going to say is really hard for people because it's so ingrained in Oklahoma. People think that you go to a bar to get drunk, and that is not what a bar is for. And not in Oklahoma. A bar is a public place. You can ne never, ever be intoxicated in a bar in Oklahoma. Not only that, you can't be served in the point of intoxication in a bar. So I just like to kind of put that in there, some good background for you guys. Here's another visual. I love visuals. What I want you to take away from this slide is not all drinks are the same. 
a container does not equal container equals a container. So if you look at 12 ounces of regular beer equals nine fluid, eight to nine fluid ounces of malt liquor, equals five ounces of table wine, equals 1.5 ounces of shot. Alcohols are different. So a different amount of alcohol and a different type of alcohol is not the same as another alcohol. So let me get this, bring this home a little bit better for you. Red Solo Cup, a lot of people don't know this. A red Solo Cup, not the knockoff, but the actual Red Solo Cup have lines that are delineated on the cup for different amounts of alcohol. So you've got the bottom line for liquor, the next one for wine, the next one for malt, and the next one for beer. So let's say I go to a party and I like to have a glass of wine. I take my little Solo Cup up to the bar there and I say, fill my cup up, I want, I want a wine. And they fill it all the way up to the beer. And you can see the beer is clear at the top, but if we look back, if I can get this to move, if we look back at the slide I had earlier, you can see what the amount for wine is. It's a five ounces of wine. So by the time you're filling that up to the top of that red solo cup, it's no longer a drink of wine. It's more than that. It's two possibly going on to three amounts of, of uh, wine. So people need to understand that one drink does not equal a drink. Let me give you another example. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Four Loco. That's a, a, a type of alcohol that you can buy in a liquor store. But there's one container of it, one can of it. But one can of it actually equals roughly six, a six-pack of beer in one can. So you're looking at not just one can does not equal one drink. You're actually getting into six drinks. And then if you get two cans, you're getting into 12-pack. And maybe youth do not understand that. They're just looking at they're drinking a can and not looking at how much alcohol is actually in that can. And then you get into the points of being uh, getting into a toxicity on, on alcohol. So let's talk about this. How does one sober up? Another misconception that we find. Uh, it's actually, once it's in your bloodstream, there's nothing you can do but wait for it to work its way out of your bloodstream. So how do you sober up? Drink coffee? No, not really. Just makes for a hyper drunk. Drinking water? Uh, you, you feel better. You're hydrating. Being sick or vomit, you might feel better because you get that contents out of your uh, stomach. But really, all you can do is wait and, and give time on that. That's the best thing you can do to get the alcohol out of there. Yep, you got to stop drink and uh, stop drinking and wait on that. So let's get into some of the academics about. Let's talk about this: the heavy and heavy and binge drinking alcohol drinkers, age 12 to 17, compared to those who did not drink alcohol in the past month. Twice as likely to have poor school work, four to six times more likely to cut classes or skip school, and to show a direct correlation to lower GPAs based on the number of incidences of binge drinking. So definitely, alcohol does affect the academics for sure. I have some more information. Age makes a difference. The University of Buffalo's Research Institute on Addictions quantified the risk of having adult drinking problem due to drinking alcohols in adolescence. The likelihood of alcohol abuse dependence increases 12% for each year of decrease in the age of the first drink. And the earlier an individual drinks alcohol, the greater the degree routine alcohol intoxication in adulthood. So what we're showing is that prevention is where it's at. The longer you can prevent that first drink of an individual, the better are they, they're going to be later and have a less of an opportunity or less of a chance to become addicted to alcohol when they get into their 20s. This is uh, Cody Greenhall. For those of you, I, I wanted to touch on the social host law for Oklahoma. Uh, Cody Greenhall was an, a, a young man that uh, went to stay the night at a friend's house. His parents thought they were just going to have a good time. and they and watch TV and watch a movie and nothing bad was going to happen, but uh, they had alcohol and they had drugs on the premise and Cody uh, drank alcohol and he um, passed out during the night and he ended up dying of alcohol intoxication and it wasn't until the next morning that they found him. But, but because of this, they found that there was nothing that they could charge the individual with for allowing that to happen, the, the parent that had uh, control of the premise. And so uh, they put a new law in the place uh, that allows for any person that allows underage drinking or drugs on a premise is going to be held responsible for that. It's, that, it's all about location, location, location. That's why it's, a, it's important. So a lot of parents do this. They think about, I'm going to do a great thing. I'm going to let my underage uh, youth and their friends come over and they're going to stay the night and I'm going to be a good parent. They're not going to drive. I'm going to take their keys from them. I'm going to let them drink here. Let them, uh, you know, be here and no problem doing that. So kids get together and we know they're not getting together to just sip wine and discuss Russian novels, right? They're getting together to get drunk and have that good time. So let's say they come over on a Saturday night and they uh, drink until they pass out at 2 in the morning. And then they get up the next morning. Hopefully they do, they do get up. They get the next morning to go to church at, say, it's 8 or 9 in the morning. So what's still happening? We know they're still intoxicated because that body can only metabolize roughly a drink an hour. And kids will leave and they get on the road. They can have an accident, kill themselves, kill somebody else. So somebody else, and those things can happen. So you have to think more than just one foot in front of you. you got to think further down the line. You know, we have a question on can we print applied? I mean, my answer would be yes, everything's open. Could you 
Yes, uh, they, they can reprint the slide. That, that not a problem doing that. Michelle said, sure, we can do that. So just to touch on this, why social host, it's all about locations, the person who owns or has control over the premise to allow underage drinking and or drugs on the premise. And it doesn't matter how old the person is. It's, it's however old the, the attorney uh, the, um, um, will be able to take those charges. So let's say some parents are out of town, they know nothing about it, and you've got a 16-year-old there at the house, the 16-year-old can be charged with allowing that to happen on the license premise or on the premise of the house, even if the parents didn't know about it, that 16-year-old can be charged with it. And it's, uh, and it's, like I said, it's adult or minors can be charged. And this is, um, you know, most youth obtain, obtain drink and alcohol on private property. That's why it's so important that this law is in place. So with a race to deter underage drinking, what's our competition? Let's look at that competition. A lot of it is marketing, definitely is marketing. You can see here you got billboards, TV, product, TV products, and packaging. I tell youth, you don't realize it, but uh, you're being marketed to. You're not even old enough to drink, but they're definitely marketing towards you, and they're looking for that next uh, generation of, of consumers to come on board. And there it is. That's money. That's what they're doing. So here we have national drug and alcohol scene. I like this slide because, once again, it's visual. But you can see that the, the drugs that are top, you've got alcohol, marijuana, prescription drugs, synthetic marijuana, and as it goes down. And I like to point out that the more readily available a drug is, the higher the use is for use. So it's more easily attainable to get the alcohol and the marijuana. So that's why those numbers are high like that. Let's look at some um, numbers here. We got underage drinking annual cost. This is nationally. You can see it's 56.9 billion, and we got figured in there the work, lost cost, medical cost, pain and suffering cost. Those are some really big numbers. Let's take a look here real quick at Oklahoma's numbers. This number has gone up. It is now one billion dollars for Oklahoma, and you can see everything that it takes in. And I like to point out to those that I teach a class. You may think alcohol does or doesn't um, affect you. Maybe it uh, does affect you because you may partake or you got friends or family, or you think it doesn't cost you anything uh, because you're uh, not, you don't drink or need to do your friends and family. But this takes in the one billion is going to be your tax dollars at work, so we're all paying for that number. And here you can see the breakdown. It gets into youth violence, youth trafficking crashes, high risk, risk sex, property, public uh, order, crime, injury for youth, and it goes on down there, but it all figures into the number. So here's some uh, nerdy numbers for you, Gina's nerdy, nerdy numbers. We've got al al alcohol's impact on Oklahoma's young people. Oklahoma ranks number three nationally for the percentage of alcohol consumed by underage youth. Underage drinkers account for nearly 17% of all alcohol consumed in Oklahoma, totaling $253 million in sales and providing $126 million in profits to alcohol industry in 2013. 63.6% of Oklahoma adolescents ages, ages 12 to 17 perceive no risk from having five or more drinks once or twice per week, and 188 .8 of Oklahoma 12th graders drove a car or a vehicle when they had been drinking alcohol past 30 days. Those are some pretty significant numbers. I'd like to uh, include this. This is the uh, Area Prevention Resource Centers for Oklahoma. There are 17 prevention resource centers across Oklahoma. Every county belongs to one. So all you guys, you belong to a prevention center. And the prevention centers would love to work with you and connect with the local community. And I'll bring this up here. You can uh, look up your county and find that information online. The reason I bring that up is I want to talk about the Oklahoma Prevention Needs Assessment. It's a really cool tool that we use. It's a statewide survey administered by ODMH SAS to students that are 6th, 8th, and 10th, and 12th graders during even-numbered semesters. The first survey measures risk, risk behaviors such as violence and alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs that can result in injury. So it's a really cool tool, and the reason it's really important is the survey, the survey results are utilized in the planning of important prevention and intervention programs within schools and communities. So your local prevention centers would love to help you with that. They will certainly help you administer the test, help you to understand your data, and they also would like to help you with grants like maybe certified healthy schools. So they certainly want to get in there and help you guys be able to do this. So here are some numbers for Oklahoma's underage drinking. These are the 2014 OPNA numbers. You can see the numbers there between 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th. The numbers are, I think, they're high. Oklahoma's numbers are high. They're a little better than they have been, so what we're doing is working, but they're still not that great, so we still have to continue doing the things that we're doing to, to do better. So you can see 40% of 12th graders report alcohol consumption in the last 30 days. I can tell you this, that uh, for the OPNA, students self-report anonymously drinking and drug behaviors. I can tell you now that the average first drink age for Oklahoma is 12 years old. And I think that is just, that's just unacceptable, crazy number. 
But let's look at this. Here we've got uh, sixth graders. That's our that's our young ones there. Uh, you can see here that, not surprisingly, I mean it is surprising, but it's not. You know, they're not able to drive, so where are they getting alcohol? They're getting it from home. But look at the number here. They're getting it from home with parents' permission. That's 30.6 percent. That is just an, an obscene number. And then you'll see the one from home without parents or without parents' permission is 23.6. That's even lower than getting it with permission. I just find that just uh, just staggering. Let's look at the next number here. We got the eighth graders. And you see, I got my little my little refrigerator there because I'm still getting it from home from someone from 21 or older, 38% at home without parents' permission, 28.5, but at home with parents' permission, 26.6. It's still a high number. And here we have our 10th graders from someone uh, they know, 21 or older, 51.5%. Someone I know under 21, you can see the numbers there. From home with parents' permission, 22.4, and from home without parents' permissions. 20.4. Those numbers are a little bit lower getting it from home because they're having a little more access to getting out. And you can see here the numbers are, are changing as well. Someone that they know older than 21, 61.7%. That number shot up. Someone I know under 21, 25.2%. From home with parents' permission is 20.3, and then other is 19.3. So we have some underage drinking trends. Um, I like to point out that drinking is, it, there's so much more involved with uh, uh, drinking than the negative things that are associated with it, the risks that are associated with it. And I like to point this out to youth or anybody that I talk to. It involves the alcohol poisoning, sexually transmitted diseases, unintended pregnancy, liver disease, school problems, social problems, abuse of other drugs, physical and sexual assault, and higher risk for suicide and homicide. So those all come into the uh, the risk for underage drinking. Now let me go back here. Let's look at that. Let's look real quick at what the definition for binge drinking is. We have for males it is five drinks or more in a two-hour period, and for females it's four drinks or more in a two-hour period. That's the actual definition. But it's gone way beyond that. It's what I call extreme binge drinking or uber drinking. They're drinking way beyond that and getting into the alcohol poisoning because they're drinking so much alcohol. And let's we'll talk a little bit about underage drinking trends for Oklahoma. Uh, we have online um, shipping to Oklahoma right now is not a, a, uh, a legal thing to do. You can see on this map here, look at the different states that it's allowed for to be able to ship directly into states. And you can see Oklahoma is a maroon one, which means we do not allow that at this time. So just note that. Powdered alcohol, uh, that's a new thing. You can do some uh, in, uh, looking up on the internet to look, look, learn more about it. It's called alcohol. It's a freeze-dried alcohol in powdered form. Really scary. Uh, I mean, kids, they, they like to advertise that it's used for camping and that you can do different things. But I've also seen where they advertise that you can sprinkle it on your eggs to eat. Uh, you can also sniff it. You can snore it, those type of things. So it's really a scary product that's out there. There are a lot of states that have banned it. You can look online to see the ones that have banned it. At this point, Oklahoma has not banned it, but I know that they have, uh, they're have. they talking about it. There's a possibility they will do it in the near future, but know that that is out there. So let's talk a minute about Alcohol EDU. That's a really cool program. It's a program that's for all of Oklahoma high schools and middle schools, and it's currently available at zero cost. Everybody can do it. ODMH SAS covers the fee to ensure the statewide adoption of Alcohol EDU as part of, the, of our 2M2L underage drinking provision in this initiative. So it's a really neat program. Let me tell you just a little bit about it here. It's created by the prevention team at Everfight, a nationally recognized program. It's included on SAMHSA's uh, National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices, and it is proven to increase knowledge, change students' attitudes and behaviors, and most importantly, to reduce the negative consequences associated with underage drinking. It is an online prevention program. It takes a project-based approach to learning. It gives students the opportunity to travel through a community to better understand the risk involved around drinking alcohol. Students travel through different points. They go through like a pizza hall, a friend's house, and they progress to unlock various tools to help them design a billboard containing positive social messages they have learned through the course. It's an interactive format, helps students understand how their decisions impact their own lives and their own community because they, they, you need to point out it is your decision. You have those decisions to make. You can either make good ones or bad ones, and we're hoping that we can help you impact those with good ones. And it incorporates multiple evidence-based lear learning of theories to drive changes to students' attitudes and behaviors. It has shown to improve students' ability to choose to not drink and also to not ride with someone who has been who has been drinking or is impaired. Thousands of Oklahoma students are already accessing it. And you can get alcohol EDU for free. You just need to reach out to ODMH SAS. You know, I got some information here for Tiffany Henry is the alcohol program director and there's her email. Michelle? I'm also going to show you how to access this program on our website. So if you don't have time to write down all that information, I'll show you how to find it later. Thanks, Michelle. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I like to include, this is what I call my thinking out of the box. Um, I've, I've taken some photos of some alcohol, and I want you to be able to look at the container first, and then look at, and tell me if you think it's alcohol or not. It may be alcohol and it may not. And the reason I include this is, so much of what we think, how alcohol should look and how it should be packaged is not really what it seems to be. If you do drink or don't drink, I still encourage you to go to a, one of your bigger liquor stores in your area. Nothing wrong with doing this and just walking through and looking at the products and the packages. You would be surprised to see how often it changes, how they're targeting young people. You can look at the colors. Some are for males, some are for females. They really do have a marketing machine when it comes to that. So here's an in interesting box that I have here. So tell me, do you think this is alcohol or not alcohol? Hmm. It looks like a juice box to me. It, Michelle says juice box. Let's take a look here. Ah, it's a box of Chardonnay. Very good. Okay, let's look at the next one here. So what do we think? Is that alcohol or not alcohol? Looks like it looks like milk. It looks like it does. It looks like chocolate milk, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it really does. So let's see what it is. You were close. It's adult chocolate milk. Wow. Yeah. So here's another one. What do you think that looks like? Hairspray. Oh, almost like a swell bottle. It's air. Okay. Yeah, I, I hear a lot that it looks like like a hair spray bottle or some kind of shampoo or something like that. And it certainly does look like that. But if you look here, it is Chardonnay again in a can. What about these? These are very popular, very prevalent. Hair gel. <laughs> <laughs> hair gel. I have a lot of women say they look, they look like candles. Yes, they do look like candles. They, these are actually called buzz balls. They have a lot of alcohol in them. If you see them near the register, especially like around Christmas time, they have them in red, white, and green, and they'll stack them up like a Christmas tree. So they're very prevalent. It's a really a uh, cheap uh, intoxication is why they're so popular right now. What about this can here? A monster drink. Some type of monster energy energy drink. Orange juice. Orange juice. That's part of the problem we're seeing is there's a, there's a really big blur between those energy drinks and alcohol and what the cans look like. And sometimes I think that's maybe they do want that blurring of the lines like that. That one's actually a Sparks, and that's alcohol as well. Let's take a look at another one. What about this one here? Juices. It does look like a juice. I, I hear that one a lot too. And that is actually a pomegranate margarita mix. <laughs> what about this one here? Shampoo, shampoo. Or, or perfume. Perfume, shampoo or perfume. It's alcohol as well. So I, I, you think about this, if you were to go into like your daughter or granddaughter's room and you see that, you would look at it and think it is um, perfume on there. And I think they do that on purpose. It's hard to see in this photo, but really is a pink color alcohol with a pink lid. And one thing we didn't know, I teach in this class one time, and I had one of the youth point out, if you take the lid off, it's actually a shot glass. It measures the alcohol that's in the bottle. So pretty astounding. I include these in here. These are just really uh, kind of popular, too. you got the pocket shots that are on the left. It's, got, it's a high concentration of alcohol. It doesn't cost very much. They're, they're a flexible bag. You see them a lot after uh, football games. You'll see them in the stadium. People can carry them in. Kids can carry them in. You won't be able to know in their back pocket, in their shirt pocket. They can buy a Coke at school. They could pour that in a Coke, and you'd never know on that. The middle one is just a little obscene, I think. It's, uh, it's called Suck and Blow, and I'll just let you use your imagination on that, but they make a jello shot out of that. Give the girl on one side and the boy on the other. It's how they exchange the alcohol when they blow on that. The other one, I talked about the four loco earlier. You see it on the right-hand side. That's the one I was talking about. It has equivalent about a six-pack of uh, beer inside of it. So that's, those are the ones you want to be looking for. Those are some unusual ones. And then I include this one as well. I just wanted you to see how they, I was saying earlier that they do blur those lines. You can see the Smirnoff ice on the left, and you got the Gatorade on the right. And just look how blue uh, those are and how similar those are. I remember there was a, a deal on, a her, uh, it was on the Internet as well about a, a mother that accidentally had grabbed the wrong uh, thing, and she grabbed the Smirnoff ice instead of the Gatorade and put it in her daughter's lunch. And it, it got to school and the daughter saw it and they put it uh, on the internet and look what my mom did. And they thought it was funny, but there is that blurring of lines, I think, so uh, you really need to be pay attention to it. And that's all I have. So, Michelle, you wanna come on up and... Thank you, you are yeah. a rock star. Thank you. Well, um, boy, I can tell you that as a counselor, that's scary to see all those different things that can happen with alcohol. But as a mom, it's terrifying. So, boy, it's um, great information. Um, this, somebody has asked if we can have a copy of the PowerPoint. 
I can share the PowerPoint with you. You also will have access to this online. We're going to have a, a YouTube channel where you can access this and watch it live if you want to hear our words. But yes, I will share this with you. In fact, I'll probably just put it on our website so you can access it there. Anybody can access it. So thank you, Gina. And Gina will be here to answer some questions at the end as well. So she's not going anywhere just yet. So talking about drugs, I did some research for you all on drugs. Um, drug overdose, to overdose deaths increased eightfold from 99 to 2012. Eightfold. Um, drugs have just really been kind of exploding on the scene. There has been a slight decline um, from 2014 to 2015, um, but as more and more drugs come on the scene, which we'll talk about, um, it's going to, to continue to climb. That number is so high, 823, even though that's a decline, that's such a high number. So the other thing I was interested in is the current waiting list for state-funded residential substance, substance abuse treatment is 800 people long. That's just shocking to me, that 800 people long, people will have to wait that long to get treatment for an alcohol problem, and those are the people who want treatment. So that is tough. So. Specifically, there are a lot of drugs out there, but the, the um, four that I'm going to share with you a little bit about today, um, marijuana, synthetic marijuana, meth, and prescription drugs, which are some of our highest uh, problem areas and things that are pretty accessible to our teenagers. So surveys tell us that about 33% of all patients in emergency rooms test positive for either alcohol or marijuana. That's a third of people who go to the emergency room have that. And you know what that tells me is that people tend to make kind of bad decisions when they're under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Um, we also have new data that shows that marijuana smoke has a higher concentration of a carcinogen than tobacco. Um, and it has like, it's linked to all kinds of problems, which you, I encourage you guys to share with your students. It has lung problems, bronchitis, emphysema, um, damage to brain and nerve cells and reproductive organs. It can lead to stillbirths and birth defects. It also um, gives, is connected with acute memory loss and lowered immune systems. So it has huge amounts of huge effects. And I know I've heard people say, well, it's just marijuana. It's not a big deal. But it is a big deal when you see all of the negative effects that it can have. So one thing that is really, um, beating the system right now is synthetic marijuana. K2 is the nickname for synthetic marijuana, and it's a, a synthetic blend of different bot botanicals. And there are all kinds of different things that you, there's plants, there's other things that they blend together that's smokable and kind of um, gives you a high. And so K2 is marketed as the legal art alternative to marijuana, but they say that uh, states are, always trying to ban certain products or certain parts of the K2. And K the K2 creators are just a step ahead. They'll change the um, ingredients just enough so it's no longer banned. A lot of these cells are online, which is really scary too, because that means our kids can get a hold of it even easier. Um, and people really don't want to tell you what's in K2. And I know that's a scary thing as well because our kids are getting this, one, thinking it's legal, but two, um, they don't even know what they're smoking, and we, we, you, know, you don't know what's in there, and so that's such a scary thing, because there could be something in there that could be lethal. We know meth is a problem. It's a stimulant. Um, you might have heard of it as crank or crystal meth. Um, this is what was on um, Breaking Bad, if you guys were Breaking Bad fans. But it is very addictive. Um, it could be injected or snorted. It could be a rock. It could be smokable, smokable as, as ice. Um, regardless of the form, when it's ingested, it causes agitation, increased body temperature, or paranoia, or may even lead to a condition known as amphetamine psychosis or even death, not to play around with. Um, Narco or prescription medication, commonly misused prescription drugs, narcotics, morphine, heroin, codeine. I wanted just to mention to you that you are able to get uh, prescription disposal boxes or prescription lock boxes. 
Um, that's something that you could look at the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotic, Narcotics and contact them and they can get you those. There's also a lot of prescription drop sites, usually at police stations that are pretty monitored. But that is something where you can get rid of those prescription drugs. They don't want you to throw them away and they don't want you to put them down the toilet um, because that can uh, change your water and it also can be, they can be stolen. So that's a pretty scary thing. And we know that our kids are doing this um, because they're easily accessible. Um, they've got family members with, with these. I mean, even think something like Ritalin, which is an ADHD medication that a, um, could, a child could actually be prescribed for ADHD, but another family member takes it, and instead of calming a person down, it has the opposite effect if you don't have ADHD, and it, gets, it makes you, gives you a high or gets you kind of wired. So it's such an easy thing and it's such a slippery slope for our kids. Um, so there's this something called naloxone, naloxone, and you can get this at a pharmacy without a prescription. Basically, this is a drug that can reverse an opioid, opioid overdose when used in enough time. And there's actually some talks happening right now about getting this into schools where um, a registered nurse or your your school nurse, as long as they're registered or certified, could maybe even administer the dosage in a crisis situation. So this is a this is one that is does not need a prescription that you could go to right now to your your pharmacy and get this drug in case of an opioid overdose. So that's something that's kind of changing and something you might actually be able to look for in the future. Um, come on, change. There we go. So. Here's some common signs of drug misuse. And these are signs that you really will be able to tell as a educator. Changes in attendance or work at school. I mean, if you have a kid who's suddenly absent all the time or skipping school or not doing their work or doing a terrible job, you might, that might be a drug issue. Um, change from normal capabilities. Maybe they are really hard workers and they're suddenly all of a sudden very lazy or not working very hard or not able to get as much done. Poor physical appearance, including inattention to dress and personal hygiene. Is this a kid who hasn't showered in a week? Like, what's going on with this kid? This is something that you should pay attention to. A kid who is wearing sunglasses constantly at inappropriate times, like during their math test. Um, they're maybe hiding their eyes. Maybe their um, pupils are dilated or constricted. Um, or maybe they're red because of, or bloodshot because of some other drug like marijuana. Um, an unusual effort to cover their arms in order to hide needle marks. And I want to say this too to you counselors, that could also be an indication of self-injury. So when you have a kid who's wearing sweatshirts and long sleeves when it's 150 degrees outside, that's something that you want to be concerned about and maybe look, look at more. If they're associating with known drug users, um, and if they're stealing, which can be um, something that can be sold for cash to support a drug habit. All signs of drugs misuse. And really, anytime you're doing drugs, it's misuse. to really just drug use. So what do I do as a counselor? Because it is a complicated situation, and there's a lot of things that you could be doing, and there could be things that your principal is asking you to do that maybe you shouldn't be doing. So let's look. There's four main areas I want to talk about today. Acknowledge encourage, provide resources, and educate. So educate yourself, and that's what you're doing today, and I really commend you for taking the time to educate yourself on this issue. The current trends, if you see an article about uh, youth and drugs, I would read it, pay attention to what it says, attend any trainings that you can, that you can go to, even if it's just a webinar, um, talk to your administrators, teachers, students, and parents about the problem, uh, we know that it's tough for people to want to talk this, about this problem because it's not a problem people are looking to talk about very much. Um, they're kind of embarrassed, especially with parents. Um, but it is something that you need to be taking the main role in educating the rest of your staff about and teaching guidance on this to your kids, having parent meetings to talk about this. Gain knowledge on special community conditions. So if you know that there are, in your community, there's a lot of mess. That is something you need to have as a focus in your school. If you know that there is a lot of marijuana usage, that's something you should be addressing at your school. And we also have a research library that I'll show you here at the end of my presentation, some 
some things that you can find in our resource library <clears throat> that you can educate yourself better on on this on this issue. So we want you to encourage. So when a student gets caught, your role is not it is to help them move forward. It's not that to investigate. You are not an investigator. You should not be the person giving consequences. Your role really is to focus on moving forward and recovering from something really bad, a really bad decision that they make. So every time that you have a, a kiddo who's in trouble, suspended for drugs or alcohol, I encourage you to reach out with a parent and let them know that they're not alone and maybe even share some resources with them. So in our resource library that I told you about, we have 66 DVDs, 19 curriculums, and 64 books. And out of all those, the ones on substance abuse, we have 15 DVDs, four different curriculums, and four books on this topic alone. So we have a lot of resources available. Our resource library is something you actually can submit a form to and check out for a couple of weeks um, and then send back to us. So it is free, and it's for you to use. So here are the DVDs that we have on um, substance abuse. And you can see there's some that are on meth, there's some that are on tobacco, um, there's some on drinking and driving, there's some on prescription medications, um, there's some on the 12 step process. So there's a lot of different ones, uh, drunk driving, a drug driving, a lot of different things you can use. And the curriculums are pretty good too. And the books, and these are books that you might even preview yourself, and then maybe your school could buy them and offer them for parents, or at least suggest them in your newsletter that you should be, that I'm sure you're sending home to parents or emails about what's out there for parents. There's another group called Parents Helping Parents. It's a great, great parent-led, parent-started, um, parent-supported group established in 2001 by a group of Oklahoma City Metro parents desperate for support during their children's substance abuse use. So there's chapters in Edmond, Enid, McAllister, Norman, Shawnee, Tulsa, and even Wichita, Kansas. Um, the website for this is listed below. If you, you could even encourage your parents to start their own chapter, but this is a great, it's just a support group for parents who've gone through substance abuse with their children and it's something that a lot of parents are ashamed to talk about or admit, but this is a great group that I would really encourage you to find out more information about. Um, and if you live near or in one of these com communities that are listed below, I'd reach out to the people who run it, and maybe they could come and do a booth at your school. Maybe they could come to an event and set up a booth. Maybe you could get them to speak to parents, but this is a great, a great support group for parents. So providing resources for parents is really important. So some people like to print articles and keep them kind of in their back pocket to give to parents whenever they um, are working with a student who's had a drug or alcohol issue. It's important to know what treatment facilities are available. And you saw that the waiting list is 800 people. So that's not even the best thing that you can do. But it, maybe they could get into some drug and alcohol counseling. There's different. It, it's, I've tried to put together some resources for the state with you for you about different areas that had treatment facilities but or counseling, but it's so extensive and there's so many different places that you're going to really have to get to know your community to see what's available there. And even support groups like Parents Helping Parents, there might be a different support group, but gaining the knowledge of what those are and sharing that information with your parents is really important so they don't feel like that they're alone. And then what should you do to educate? So we talked a little bit about this already. Guidance lessons, um, parent nights, really training your teachers through professional development is so important. Just this first part of this session that Gina did would be a great thing for you guys to, to um, train your teachers on to be looking for. I'm sure they would be equally shocked as I am. <laughs> So um, contacting the ABLE Commission and, or Gina and we'll have her contact information and seeing what she could do for your school or area or if, if there's another ABLE agent who could do that would be something that they would love to do. And then maybe putting out a newsletter that has information. So educate, educate, educate because it's changing all the time and providing information more than just during Red Ribbon Week this month. 
not just taking a week, but doing it a little bit all the time. And guidance lessons, I, we have some guidance lessons on the website that I'll show you. Um, it's important that we're doing this all the time, letting people know about it all the time. So now, um, I want you to think of your questions. I'm going to jump over to our website while you're thinking your, of our questions, and you can go ahead and put them in in the, the chat area. And if you have not signed up yet uh, or signed in yet, please take the time to do that right now. But I'm going to go to our website and show you our substance abuse page. Let's go a different way. Okay, we're going to go a different way. Oh, that's right. Share. Okay. Now we're going to do that. Okay. So we're going to find this website right here. I don't know what that little button we've got going on here. Okay. There we go. I should have done this in advance. Sorry, no, friends. Sorry. I don't know what that's doing to you. Stay declined. Okay. Let's just shut that box down. Now I hit it again with any other browsers. Okay. Just kidding. Here we go. Here's our website. So you can go just type in counseling up here in this box, which we'll do. And you see this takes you to your, our counseling page. So here was our counseling page. We have prevention. And I want you to look at the substance abuse prevention page that we have. We have a lot of resources for you here. We have some research-based curriculum. Here's Alcohol EDU that I told you you could get to. Uh, that is really important for you to be able to find. Some more curriculums that you can use. Um, here's some more information from Too Much to Lose and Alcohol EDU, and just some other um, presentations. So here's also our link to our, our library that I told you about earlier. Here's the checkout form and the resource library list of things that are in there. And um, we have some trainings from the OBN and the Oklahoma Pharmacists Association. They come out and do the Road to Nowhere, which is a good training that you could do with kids. If you've not done that, I, I, I mean, I suggest that you look into that. SWAT, Too Much to Lose. Some, some laws, frequently asked questions, and a lot of resources for you all. So we have lots of different ways that you could um, look at, lots of different things you could look at. And we also have some kits and some printouts for you all. Lots of different stuff. So that is on our substance abuse prevention page. And you can find it there. Hey, Gary, how do I get back? There we go. Okay, you sign in right here on this link, this tiny URL drugs webinar link that I've got over here on the left side of this page. Yes, I said I will share a copy of the PowerPoint with you. You can print any of it that you want and use any of this. Um, we do have the links or the actual where we got the information from on the slides. And actually, I'll put these on our website, this presentation on our website. So do you guys have any other questions for us? No questions? Let me change your chat box a little bit just in case. OK, perfect. Any more questions for us? Don't be afraid to ask, because if you're wondering, then surely somebody else is wondering as well. Um, so make sure you sign in. Can you put the link in the comments? I can. That's a great idea. I'm putting the link in the comments right now. Okay. There is the link in the comments. So you can just click on that, and um, that'll take you to sign in. So again, when you sign in, you get a professional development certificate and a CEU certificate. So the question we have here is, what products are you familiar with that a student can take that will show a, that will show a negative, even though you're certain they've been smoking marijuana? That's a great question, and I honestly don't know the answer. But what I'll do if I don't know the answer to your question is I will do some research for you 
Um, I'll get a copy of this, and I will send out an email to this group and let you know what I come up with. So not sure. I'm sure there's some prescription medication that could have that effect, but I'd have to call somebody at the Bureau of Narcotics to find out. So I definitely will do that for you. That's a good question. Any other questions that you all have? Any other ones? We're going to just stay for a minute. Make sure you sign in. We are really, really thrilled that you came today. Thank you so much for coming and spending your hour with, not quite an hour with us. Um, I hope this was valuable information. I feel like I learned a lot from Gina, and I hope it's something that is helpful to you. I hope you um, have found the information on the website to be helpful. Um, there's a lot of new information on our website, so please check out all of the counseling and prevention pages. There's lots of new things that are up there. That resource library, too, is a great um, list, and I'm going to send the link um, to our website to you. So it's in the comments as well. There is our link to our website, to the counseling page, and that will get you to all the prevention things as well. So if you haven't been there lately, I'd really encourage you to go. Um, also, I wanted just to share why I've got you guys, let you know that we have rescheduled the Building a Crisis Team webinar for Tuesday, November 1st um, at noon. So if you need, if you have signed up, you have to go back and sign up again. You're not going to just automatically be registered for that. Uh, again, I apologize for having to count to uh, cancel it. We were actually working a crisis in a district, so um, I'm getting some thank yous on our on our chat. We're really appreciative. Um, those of you who are first time webinars webinar folks, we're glad you came. Um, and we are really glad. We do value you very, very much here at the State Department. And I know that um, Shelly Ellis, who's sitting in here with us, and I both feel like we are here to serve you. So if you have other suggestions or ideas on how on presentations you need, if you'd like for us to come out and do a presentation, all you have to do is contact us. And I think uh, I don't have our I'm going to put our contact information back up here real quick. This is my contact information um, and Gina's contact information. So if you need to get in touch with us for any reason, you are able to do that. We very much want to help and do what we can to support you all. We know how hard you work. We've been counselors. Um, and we are really help, hoping that we can help you as much as possible. I just want to thank Gina Pratt for coming in today and sharing such great, valuable information and with us and scaring me to death, <laughs> which I'm sure she scared some of you also if you have teenagers like I do. So she's done her, she says she's done her job correctly if we are scared. So <laughs> um, I hope you can find that information valuable to use during Red Ribbon Week or at other times in your year. And if there's any way we can support you, we definitely want to do that. You guys have a great, yes, I will post the link again. I've got somebody asking for me to post the link again because we lost connection. There is the link again, one more time for you all that you can click on. Um, so we're going to do that, and hopefully you'll have a chance to sign in, because that is how I'm going to email you the information. Right when I go upstairs from this, I'm going to send out the information for all of those of you signed in. So you guys are awesome. Oklahoma has the best counselors in the world. Um, even though I might be a little bit biased, I appreciate you very much. I know you're out doing the hard work. So let us know how we can help you, and I hope everybody has a fantastic rest of your Tuesday. Mm -hmm.